Zach here, and we have a great guest on the podcast today, Todd Smith, the CEO and founder of Core AI, also a serial entrepreneur. Todd, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Super excited to be here, Zach. Uh, I, as I, we talked a little before uh, in the green room, it was uh, good to catch up. It's been a while, so it's amazing what you did with uh, Selly. So. Well, glad to have you on. And Todd, tell us a little bit about your background, your entrepreneurial background, your previous company, and how you got started in the auto industry. Yeah, I, look, I, I believe my entrepreneurial background probably started in third grade when I go to the local Wawa and buy Jolly Ranchers by the bag full and sell them uh, mm -hmm. until ultimately I got suspended for doing that uh, in school. So obviously giving selling candy to kids at a quarter of a piece and making good money was a bad idea. Uh, so they kind of stymied my entrepreneurship early. But, uh, you know, I, I've always, I think, been an entrepreneur at heart. I was raised by a mom who was, had her own business, you know, just came from that type of family. Um, car business, I'd always been around. So both my neighbors were big auto dealers. Uh, F.C. Kerbeck on one side of me and the Miller family on the other in New, uh, Ocean City where I grew up. So I was always just had a love for cars. My dad uh, did restore a bunch of cars. There was always cars in garages that we had half assembled, some running, some with cool like rumble seats in the back. So, you know, I was always in those old cars from Model T's, 56 Roadsters as a kid. So just love the business. Um I surfed, obviously, my whole life, too, as well, since I was like five and uh, competed. And at a point, you know, you have to make money to travel. So I started cleaning cars at 16. And then I said, man, those guys with the white shirts inside, they seem to have a better life. They got they have access to donuts, food, air conditioning. Seems like a good idea. So started my hand at selling cars at 18. Uh, that turned into sitting at basically every seat in a store. So from used car manager, new car manager, GM, and ultimately ran a multi-store group, ultimately then uh, became a partner and owned a Chevy store in North Jersey. Um, but, you know, running a car dealership, super entrepreneurial, but my heart was still somehow stuck in tech. I, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know why, I have an older half-brother. He had like one of the first gateway computers. We were on CompuServe. Just feel <laughs> like I had this crazy passion uh, for technology. I, I don't know why. It just was always there and uh, still there, <laughs> even today. So. Very impressive. And with Core AI, what inspired you to focus on identity verification and fraud prevention in the automotive retail space? Yeah, a crazy story. Um, two things uh, for us. And, and Core always started as a vision of, hey, how can I rethink my previous chat company into a new light, making it more collaborative commerce happen, right? And to do that, I also realized, well, for many people, that's going to start online. And how do you tell the person online? Like, who are they? And I sat and had dinner with a ex-FBI, um, pretty high up person mm -hmm. in the organization and we were talking about fraud and he told me that during the pandemic we, we had all these ppp loans and i guess about 300 billion dollars of money was defrauded out of the u.s government which staggering to think our where our taxpayer dollars went and uh he said that during that time all these fraudsters honed their skills to produce fake licenses, fake documents. They, they got really, really good at it. And then that money dried up. So then they started to look for new avenues. And this dinner conversation sat with me. This was about three years ago. And I, I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. And I was like, and he said, you know, auto will be one of their next targets. Hmm. And it was probably two years ago, I'm sitting there and here's a dealer lost like a quarter of a million dollars in a month on wow. fraud and it's like four transactions and, and i sat there and i was like oh my gosh and then you know you start asking dealers what are you doing in groups and i heard everything from no we just photocopy a license and then we 
maybe just run some synthetic ID or something in the back. I was like, well, that's not going to stop fraud. And then some dealers, you know, maybe less than 20% had scanners. And I was like, well, that's not going to stop it because they already figured out how to do licenses or you can buy fake licenses on Telegram or Signal or, you know, on the dark web with the Tor browser. You can buy one for mm -hmm. six, 700 bucks. It'll pass any of those scanners. So I was like, there's a problem that needs to be solved here. And smart dealers who are trying to organize compliance, stop fraud early, will always have a competitive advantage. So that led me that this became one of our our core things for core was identity and figuring out how to quickly onboard consumers, do it friction as with the least amount of friction as possible. And also in a way that the consumer onboards themselves and the dealer doesn't have to touch their ID or any of their PII. That's really interesting and kind of leads into my next question. So something really big in auto cybersecurity happened recently, and I wanted to get your perspective on the recent CDK hack, how yeah. it impacts the auto industry from your perspective. And one, one short story on my side, what was surprising, the day CDK got hacked and it was national news and it was on CNBC even my neighbors in San Francisco were asking me about auto software and dealer management system or software was coming out of their mouths, which was really you know surprising for me, national news. So what are your take on that? I, I, same for me. My, my mom is like, hey, I heard about this hack. Did that affect your business? <laughs> and and I, I sat there. I was like, no, mom. But um, it was a long time coming. It was inevitable. And for multiple reasons, one, I would say most of these systems are using this monolithic style architecture um, with firewalls that are, are prone to like full frontal attacks. And most of them, you know, you put up a, a good vault door, but you walk around the side and it's like a screen door and I just got to pop my finger through it and find one open port. And that's what they hunt for. Uh, you know, with phishing schemes and, you know, there's all kinds of different ways they can approach access into these systems. And I think some of these uh, big companies also have crazy vulnerabilities because they acquired multiple companies that all have different architectures mm -hmm. and none of them have stitched together right well, also causing huge security gaps and opportunities for, um, you know, cyber criminals to tap into. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, obviously outsourcing a lot of your development overseas comes with a risk. But I will say there's amazing developers all around the world. I, I can't lead that as the real reason that anything like that would happen. But the other side is, you know, double tripling down on security versus, you know, a $20 million booth at NADA probably might be a good <laughs> idea. Um, just, you know, food for thought. Um you know, and it's hard that some of these companies are out selling security services and, you know, they're not really in the security business. I feel like it's another way to try to capitalize on dealers being naive and not really understanding that security is a whole different world. It's like, you know, it's okay. like going to Mars. It's, it's not a moon landing and just buying and building software is one thing, but building a system that operates at the highest level of security today takes a tremendous amount of effort and different thinking. And I feel these systems today, almost all of them in auto just don't have that. They weren't built with that first, or it was a cottage into a cottage product that grew up and was bought by one of these guys and bolted on. And then you have all types of just tech incompatibility. So you know, it, it was interesting. I think it was inevitable. I think you'll see more. I, I don't think this is the last. And definitely. And I honestly, I, I don't I don't even know if I would say for a hundred percent like they still don't have access inside CDK. You know, I I've read enough and listen, I'm an armchair. Uh, I don't know anything <laughs> of what went on with CDK, right? I don't have any true inside knowledge. But I do know if you look at just general statistics on these types of breaches, they never recover 100% of their system. There's always new increased vulnerabilities. Um, 
you know, and it's kind of a double dip, right? They're going to CDK pay them, which kind of is like paying a terrorist organization, if you think about it, right? Because, you know, these a lot of times these companies have state ties uh, because they work for states like, you know, um, so that's interesting in and of itself. And, you know, did they leave a back door? We'll never know. Could they continue to scrape data out of the system? We'll never know. Um, so it, it's just dangerous, you know? And that, that's why I think different architectural styles, like more like Intuit, it's built like, uh, you know, serverless, mm -hmm. using zero trust uh, protocols, using, you know, uh, what I would call like perimeterless security functionality, same which is what you would see like in AWS, which I would consider probably the most secure thing or one of the most secure nothing is bulletproof but um you know you kind of want to lean into the guys who you know i i think have built and are willing to commit the financial resources to security at a level that you know doesn't exist in auto so definitely agree with some of the points you made and you know you even look at the fine that they they are the I guess, ransom that they had to pay, you know, CDK to the hackers. And I think that opens up the floodgates. It shows a lot of hackers out there, like the value of automotive data, how large some of these companies are, you know, they're private equity backed, et cetera, and they could pay, you know, larger fines. So I definitely think that in the hacker arena, you know, brings some awareness to like auto software, you know, based yeah, it, on that. It, it didn't help. Definitely yeah. shined a light on us and not a good definitely. light. And, you know, that kind of leads me into my next question, going back to kind of your product and thinking about fraud in the industry. How prevalent is transactional fraud in auto dealerships? And what are some of the common types of fraud that like dealers face? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. So if we look at the data, probably this year, somewhere around 7.9 billion in fraud will enter wow. uh, auto through lending. Uh, this can come from a multitude of ways. Uh, identity theft, right? Easy. Uh, this is where you know people present fake documents to buy a car. Uh, that also falls into like synthetic ID fraud, right? Where people have stood up a, a clone identity of you, Zach, and they've nurtured it for a couple of years and then they kind of break out and they go crazy, buy a bunch of stuff, and then it all hits your credit report and you're like, what happened? <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Um, so that that's one side. Two is income misrepresentation. That's a big one. So that yeah. happens when, you know, it, listen, it could be first party fraud, meaning a salesperson says, oh, they're on the verge of being qualified. Hey, Zach, don't you drive Uber like once a week and make an extra $300 <laughs> a month? Right? Like, right. pencil it in. No, let me let me do your credit app, right? Like, this happens um, because... Salespeople want to sell cars, and I, I can't blame them. They have families to feed, kids to feed. Uh, so I think for us, you know, there, there's all these types of fraud. O almost 60%, it starts internal, <laughs> like fraud. So people taking uh, data off a system, like downloading, let's say, put a, a, a zip drive in and let me go grab uh, all your sold customers. Right. And now I'm going to take that data that all has PII attached to it because there was no protocol to not allow that download to happen inside a system, which is crazy. So there, I think there's a multitude of risk there for the average dealer. And that risk kind of cascades. Right. It, it, it's like a ripple. So that happens. And let's say, Zach, someone took your ID and you're mad now. So you go back and say, it started here at this dealership. This dealership didn't run ID. I'm suing the dealer now for not protecting me and my consumer rights. Mm -hmm. Lender comes back and goes, hey, uh, this isn't the real Zach. Uh, you owe us now because for the lender, it's considered an arm's length transaction. So the dealer is the direct trans actor with the consumer. And because of that, the dealer's like liable, not the lender. So the lender's going to say, hit their recourse is going to like, give me my money back. And the dealer's going to go, oh my God, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to call my cyber policy. And the dealer's going to read his cyber policy and it's not going to cover it um, in most cases. So that's a problem. There's lawsuits. I just posted one today. Cyber will most likely not cover a transaction that happened for a remote party 
you're selling a car at the dealership and sometimes not even people that walked into your store. So again, problems there. And then, you know, you get on the list. The lender said, you let one slip by the goal and you're putting our business at risk. So now we're going to watch your loans a little closer. And there is a secret list, I think, between all the lenders. They all talk. I've talked <laughs> to many people high up in some of these organizations that, you know, they keep a Santa bad list for sure of known offenders. So they watch those loans. So to me, like, as I said, it's like a rippling effect. So I think dealers, the smart ones will stop it up front and the groups need to normalize processes, reduce bias of onboarding customers as also kind of protecting it outside of the hands of an individual salesperson or F&I manager making those decisions. Because that's the other side. When you put, it's like the wolf determining which chicken in the hen house is good. You're like, right. you can't have that because someone's pay plan is tied to selling cars. And now you're putting a process that you want them to stop selling cars. You're going against what you're telling them every day to do hmm. by looking at a deal and saying, well, this guy's fraudulent. That's why people turn a blind eye, deals get done, deals get through, and then dealers pay that ramification later. Wow. And could you explain how secure deal document management works and why it's essential for protecting PII? Yeah, so this is definitely a growing thing. Uh, I was just in a deal, I was just talking to <laughs> a friend of mine, Tom Klein, uh, who has a compliance company. And he's literally showing me pictures. He goes, I went in this dealership. There was a, in the, I'm going to, it was an open aired uh, sales desk, typical. Behind the sales desk was a cabinet with a key in it, the door open, and in a, what do you call like a bin, was probably 60 credit reports. <laughs> oh my God. So this type of data held in paper form is an enormous risk. So anything the dealership can do to digitalize, so stop printing out driver's license, photocopying them, you're exposing PII into the real world instead of holding it securely. And I will tell you, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of uh, manila envelopes I've never seen one secure. You just pop the lid and you can get into it, right? Yeah. Like you go into dealership and they have all these printed jackets. And the reality is that's an opportunity for someone to mishandle that data um, and take advantage of it. You know, if we go into any dealership today, we find PII on salespeople's phones, copies of driver's license, insurance cards, proof of income, W-2s, we find it on salespeople's desks. We find it in desk oh, drawers. Yeah. It's all there. So I think part of our goal is helping dealers digitalize that. And, and there are solutions out there, right? There's doc vault things. There's things. Uh, we just wanted to make it easier. So we wanted to do it through conversational commerce, meaning the customer's already in the conversation. If we can securely have them uh, a, a vehicle to upload data, store it, and then manage it downstream, but digitally, we think that's the best world that we should all focus on and help dealers reduce that, what we just call document exposure. So I wanted to move on to some questions around credit. So how does credit affordability impact a customer's ability to purchase a vehicle? And what trends are you seeing in this area? What role does technology play in this area as well? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Zach. And I break this down. Um, I'm sure in your, in your original CRM, you pull credit and then you have a credit report, right? So you're looking at a FICO score, you're looking at trade lines, you're you're kind of getting a, a flow. And this is typical, right? This could be 700 credit, everyone returns, whether a soft or hard pull credit report. And you look at that customer, it's an 810. You're like, Psh, golden, right? No problem, this guy's, <laughs> and then you submit him to the bank and the bank's like, no, he's 96% debt ratio, he's buried. And you're like, oh, and affordability is literally rising to the top of probably one of the most important things we should be looking at today, because 
we've had a rise in rates, right? That's affecting mm -hmm. deal flow. Uh, definitely constriction to the lenders. So they're definitely eyeballing deals more. Um, we have many consumers now who are what I call the uh, post-COVID now looking to trade out of cars that they're buried in. So you have a lot of negative equity that needs to go forward. Um, actually just came out today, U, uh, U.S. citizens saved the least amount of money. Um, so everyone's debt is on the rise. So we look at affordability as a better indicator of purchase potential. And we can look at a household and go, okay, household income's X, debt of household is Y, our mathematical formula says this. Then from that, you can then, okay, let's punch them to what inventory should fit them better, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And also based on other characteristics with our partnership with Equifax, we get lots of data. So we know that behaviorally, they're in a cohort that they're going to buy a Traverse, a Honda Pilot, or X. So we even know what vehicles to show them, but you need the affordability first. So I, I think affordability is rising because also over the last couple of years, we haven't had to desk deals very hard. Sure. We had less inventory. Customers come in, they pay what we want. As long as our credit matched, I send it, submit it to one or multiple banks. Lending was easier. It just all worked. Uh, I see constraints everywhere today, right? Constraints from the lender, inventory value, customers deeper in debt. Uh, all that has to be re kind of configured and, and kind of triangulated. And AI is literally perfect for this. Like it's perfect for taking multiple data sets, finding a commonality or, or uniqueness around that and re now giving me back a understanding of what it's looking at. And that's where I, I see our business going in this direction. And I think it'll just speed transactions, but it's also going to speed the product to consumer fit. Nothing is worse than, and, and a good example I would always have where customer comes in and as a salesperson, customer says, look, I want to drive the Subaru Outback. So me as a salesperson, with the, I go, okay, this customer wants to buy a Subaru Outback. It's not what the customer said. I'm just assuming the consumer wants a Subaru Outback, right? So I show them a Subaru Outback. But let's say the customer can't buy a Subaru Outback. Pricing's wrong. Right. Most salespeople will just stop. But we have other things. And that's a that's a very loose thing. So I think our goal was to say, okay, let's bubble to the salesperson. Look, customer may be here on the outback, but here's some other vehicles in stock that this particular consumer, based on what we know about them, has a very high propensity. Most likely they would buy one of these two. We don't want to just say we've predicted it all because that sounds super creepy, Zach. <laughs> and on the desk, we want to show them, hey, this customer, this is their true credit profile based on affordability. So and match those things. So desk sees one thing, customer or salesperson sees another. And this allows a salesperson to have a better conversation with the consumer that's a little bit more thorough. Versus going back to the desk and they go, yeah, we, we can't do that deal. And the customer is like, well, I'll go home and think about it, drives to another lot, goes and buys that pilot, which you had a late model used one, didn't even offer to the consumer. They go <laughs> buy it from somewhere else. So I see using this type of data in a new lens um, to help the dealer, again, better get that. Like I call it almost like a fit and finish, right? Like Toyota is really great at that fit and finish for product. Uh, Tesla, not so much, and <laughs> kind of really kind of honing that. I, I see there's a huge world of opportunity there. And I think for us, we just want to be there. We want to be at the tip of that spear. So. Definitely. And going back to your product, how does your product help dealers with identity verification, fraud prevention, kind of some of what we've been talking about so far? Yeah, so our identity is built in, it's kind of like a, called a multi-signaling process. So for the consumer who's at home, uh, our first thing is we're looking at the browser. Um, is this browser on a VPN? Are they incognito? 
Is it from a known already fraudulent IP, which has been identified? All this data we collect through partners. Uh, and we look at about over 200 signals just at the browser. We actually tag their browser. So even if they move between devices, we still know it's them uh, because we've wrapped that data. So we look at that uh, first. And then once the consumer is coming in or has made the commitment to come in, we want to verify the de device first. So way before we even get to a driver's license, we want to look at the device because your device has a SIM card. That SIM card was it recently activated. You know, is it a burner phone? Like we can tell a lot from our partnership uh, with the carriers to know mm -hmm. that this device has longevity. And because of that longevity, I can now ID you. And I know it's in your possession at that moment. So we, our process is we do browser and then uh, we have an app for salespeople. Customer hits the app, uh, pulls up and says, auto will pull their phone number or say, just add your phone number. We go to the carriers, we bring it back and we pre-fill all the data from the carrier. So the customer's legal name, their home address, uh, we leave email open, even though we get a 20 plus percent hit rate, because we found that most consumers have multiple email addresses. So we mm -hmm. want them to put their best email address in. We've already validated the phone number. All that data pushes automatically to the CRM uh, and tags the salesperson. At that point, then we're going to go to the driver's license. And, and we want live capture of the front, the back, and a liveness selfie of the consumer. So we're gonna look at the attributes around the license. Uh, does the front meet the back? We're gonna OCR all that data out of it. So we have that to use downstream. Um, we're gonna match their face to what's on the license. And in 43 states, we'll go to the DMV if necessary. Does it need to happen on every customer? If you're a known entity, me, Zach, you, you and your family bought six cars from me, I don't need to check the DMV. Um, mm -hmm. I can just go through what I call a less friction um, process for you, but I still want to capture uh, some of that data, just don't need the DMV. And then finally, we're going to look at, okay, we'll run synthetic ID, we'll run OFAC, you know, we'll run red flag, we'll run additional services in the background. Uh, usually, we'll hold those until we see a prequal or credit, because there's no use having that expense as a dealer unless I've gotten that far in the process with the consumer. So we've created this multi-signaling triggering process um, that we can do as little or as much of it as we want. So the browser is always happening. Maybe the customer comes in and says, hey, Zach, I'm here just to look around. I'm not even driving nothing today. No worries. We can just we can do your device ID and move on. No problem. We don't even need to do any of the rest. And if they want to drive, then good. We add the driver's license to it. Oh, cool. I want to send them the pre, uh, pre-qualification form or do something right in messaging. Or now they want to fill out a credit app. Cool. Do it right through the same experience. <laughs> so for us, fraud is a very, it's a dynamic process. And more than it's being dynamic, it's constantly evolving. You have AI coming in as, for our side, <laughs> to protect the consumer's identity, protect the dealership, but also the fraudsters are using these tools against us. So you've already, I'm, I'm sure, look, you're a tech yeah. guy, you get like, you've seen voice cloning. If you saw yeah. Reed Hoffman, have you seen that, that he yeah. created a whole clone of himself, which if that Crazy. person started <laughs> talking to you, you would think you were talking to Reed Hoffman, not talking to a digital clone. So we're going to have to contend with all these tools that the fraudsters uh, are utilizing today. And so just as we're countering, they're countering, and there's no end to this. It's like once you jump into this pool, we're going to be fighting fraud for our dealer clients forever. And we know that. And it's constantly going to change. We'll be adding and changing processes in the system. And I think our ultimate mandate was provide the consumer the least amount of friction, but ensure the maximum protection to the dealership. And what are some of the challenges that dealers face when they're trying to implement new security measures? You know, some yes. of what we've talked about and how they overcome or how do they overcome some of them? Uh, I'm going to give you two, and, and I'm sure you sure. had this experience. 
One is salespeople and dealership staff, what I call software PTSD. They've tried so many systems. They just, the sales guys are like, what do we got to learn now? How long is it going to be here? They're going to stop using this in three months and they're going to want to revert to old habit really fast, right? So I think that is one side that we always have to contend with and, and be cautious of as well as um, just conscious that we need to think how to make it easy for salespeople in the dealership to be able to do that. On the other side for dealers, smart dealers will think compliance more first and organizing their dealership to remove sensitive spots that exposes customer PII to their team um, as well as put them outside of alignment with whether it's FTC cars ruling that whenever that goes into effect uh, or any other type of legal requirements. It could be TCPA, CCPA, take your pick. Um, dealerships, a lot of time, their processes operate on the edge of these things and it's dangerous. And I think with the fine of over 50K, for instance, <laughs> on this new FTC one, if it happens, dealers are going to have to really double down on a compliance first process that can be automated as much as possible that human bias doesn't play a factor in. So that's the other thing, you know, and I found, and it's interesting, the data shows us where if the system just does it and asks you the questions, you're more likely to give up the information. If me as a salesperson start to ask you, what's your home address, Zach? You're like, why do you need that? So if we can let automation take place of that um, and take bias out, that's a huge thing. The other thing is, and, I, and I'll tell you, this is a crazy story. So I was just in Minnesota at a store. Customer comes in, uh, does the device ID and looks down and goes, how do you have this address? And I just happened to be standing there. I'm like, sir, well, what do you mean? That's your home address. He goes, yes, that is my home address. I just moved to Minnesota two weeks ago. You have my new address. Wow. I have a Florida driver's license. And I was like, ah, yes, uh, the system knows. Uh, and I said, through our partnership with Equifax, Equifax, and the, between that and the carriers, we're consolidating so much data on 300 plus million uh, citizens. So we see all that data. My mom was the same. So my mom is on my business plan. My mom's address and my mom's phone number have nothing. They're not connected. Like that phone mm -hmm. number resolves to a business, business address. My mom went through our security. My, my mom is one of our testers at 77, right? Nice. Exactly. Uh -huh. You know, when you build a, you build uh -huh. a business, every, you have use cases. So my mom needs to be a use case. So my mom went through it and it pulled up my mom's home address. I, wow. I was like, even I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's super cool. <laughs> it even had her like unit number. I was like, that's crazy. I, I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> so like, I'm like a kid, like, wow. Um, and this helps dealers, right? Clean data in means clean marketing out. Clean data in means salespeople don't have to have that friction to ask for that data. Clean data in means more optimized to me marketing spend for non-buyers. And clean data in and or, or normalize allows you to pre-populate forms, allowing less friction for the consumer having to refill their name and address out four or five times or a salesperson doing it, which accounts for potential error on data entry. And nothing is worse than me saying your name is Zach and you get an F and I and your license says Zachary and now you got to <laughs> reprint all the paperwork. Yeah. So, Todd, in your opinion, how will the future of ID verification and secure document management evolve, specifically in the auto industry? Yeah, so more automation, uh, more AI doing more of the lifting. So our AI now is actually looking at the, let's say, driver's license and going, is that a driver's license? 
We have a binding box. Is it in the box? Is it in focus? It's doing all of that in real time just by mm-hmm. holding your camera over the ID. Wow. So I see a world of that just extrapolated. Like we're we're on like the six yard line of a hundred yard field, right? Uh, of where this is going to go. And it's going to get faster. It's going to require, you know, I think there's points where you want to insert friction to slow parts of processes down. It, I always was less friction is better, but it's actually not. Like all the data proves that there are points in friction where you want to slow a customer down to read something or to digest it. So we understand that and we want to incorporate that. But I believe that identity is going to continue to be a center point. Now, we'll see more and more the young generation, the Z, the millennials, they rip through systems like ours like nothing, even if there's an error. They they know how to overcome it. I'm an X or boomers. You know, maybe we still have like a couple struggle points with it. You know, I get pushed back, which is funny, like managers like, I don't want my customers to take the selfie. And I'm like, do you know how many selfies are on all your customers' Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts? <laughs> Even my That's mom funny. at 77, had. I watched my mom put a selfie on Facebook. And I'm like, mom, what are you doing? I didn't know I shared it with everyone. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> but I had I saw one lady in a, a store literally put on lipstick before she got to her selfie. She was in her probably <laughs> mid to late 60s. I see it less and less being a barrier. It, it's a good way to secure right now that I have your physicalness in possession of that license in real time. But AI on the fraudster side, they're already creating AI clones that would pass a lot of these. And I think we're going to have to constantly be vigilant to come up with different ways uh, to secure transactions. So you may, if you remember, like you've heard a lot, like out of wallet questions, mm-hmm. like, like OWs or KYC process, right? Yep. So this is, I'm going to throw this statistic at you just to blow your mind. So the stat is that 62% of legitimate consumers will fail their huh. own out of wallet questions. They won't remember. Funny. Did I have a white car? What was the first one? I don't remember that address. I never, I don't remember that work. Happens constantly. 90 plus percent of fraudulent buyers will pass all <laughs> the out of wild questions or KYC because they've studied your credit report. It's their business. It is the worst form of spotting fraud. Wow. I, I won't be surprised if lenders go away from it. So I, it's crazy. Like you start digging into this stuff and, and Zach, it's a rabbit hole, man. Like I, I'm like on these telegrams, like watching these fraudsters, like oh do IDs. Listen, I, I'm inside the beast and it's so crazy. Like I'll, I'm going to show you this. I, I don't know if it's going to come through very well, but uh, let's see if I can play this video. Uh this is a video here. Let me see if it all, I can blow it up. So hold on, let me play it. So dude, this is them showing. I see. All those are fake IDs, brother. And watch, they're just making them in a house. That's crazy. It's, it's like, this is the boot. This is real, man. And, and it's wow. like a real business because all these fraudsters have figured out how to defraud our government are now putting this like, dude, they have the skills and they, they need other markets. So think about cars, high value asset, highly mobile, right? And it's easy to fraud car dealers because they want to sell you the car. Huh. They'll look the other way. Yeah. So, and, and they don't do it on purpose, but the ambition and the drive of everyone in a dealership thinks in a 30 day cycle, right? How many units do we have out? What do we yep. blow out today? Who? What's burning gas? What's hung? What? Where are we? And with that thinking, it puts dealers at risk. And and it may be more prevalent in California, Texas, Michigan, which is the fifth, New York and Florida, 
there are the big fraudulent states. I know Michigan threw me, but yeah, that's the like, random one. I know, Everyone else, like, I understand. <laughs> dude, it was it was like a red yeah. herring. I was like, what? But super high. But as the big cities, like they're they'll tech up first, right? Yeah. Frost or move inland. Like, why do you care? And with more of the transaction being done remote, like I had one so crazy. So customer remote transaction is before our system. <laughs> so dealer got burned <laughs> on this one. Customer um, said, hey, I own a pizza place, blah, blah, blah. I'll meet you at like 2 a.m. when I'm done my shift. Car guy wants to sell a car. He shows up at the house in the middle of the night, out front, does the paperwork, leaves. Oh, my God. It was a fraudster using the person who actually lived in that house's address as the, like, jump spot. Crazy. Dude, done. Fraudulent deal. Now, I'm going to scare you even more with uh, AI voice cloning. You've seen this, right? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, voice. the frauds okay. on it. Yeah. I have my voice cloned because I, I, I like to read uh, my own blog posts. Like, so I want it in my voice, which I don't, I, I have a <laughs> voice made that's terrible, but I, I just want people to hear my voice. So, uh, so a voice clone, uh, I actually cloned uh, the head of the Montana Dealers Association's voice uh, the other day and sent him a message. And he's like, how do you have my voice? I took 15 seconds of his voice and uh i cloned it here let me uh back it up here they are all no cattle if you know what i mean just last week i had a dealer ring me up one at about our event uh, was he asking about sales strategies or cutting edge tech no this bugger <laughs> wanted to know what kind of asp we're serving Totally not him. I totally made that up. Sent it to him. He's like, dude, how do you do that? I was like, I had 15 seconds of your voice. Now, I'm going to give you a real world. I call your dealer. I talk to him for 20, 30, however long. I grab his voice print. I now take that voice print. I sit in the store. I know some people's names. I take a salesperson. I call that salesperson. I use that owner's voice. I say, hey, Zach, I need you to go get that uh, F-150 Raptor. I need you to take it down to my dentist, put it out front, put the keys under the mat. He's really busy today. He's going to drive it later, put a tag on it, come back to the store. He's going to come back around six tonight. Oh, my God. Yeah. Why not? How would you ever know that that's real? And it, it listen, if my owner called me, I'd do whatever he told me to do. Why would I question that? That is the fear of what we're entering right now. Wow. I said, like. I don't know if you do you have kids. No, not yet. Okay. So I feel like you almost have to have a safe word. I say blue, you say you say bucket that I know I'm actually really talking to you. Yeah, I've talked about that with my parents, too, because I have so much content online. It's on CNBC, Wall Street Journal, et cetera. It's so easy to get a clip of me. So I, I've thought through that as well and like a safe word. So very, very clever. And, you know, I, I was also going to my next question and what we've talked about is so fascinating. But the, the other component of this industry is regulatory changes. And I'm curious from your perspective, are there any regulatory changes on the horizon that dealers should be aware of regarding data protection, identification, verification, that sort of thing? Yeah. So look, you, you, we've all heard this FTC CARS Act, right? That's in this limbo state. Like, will it, it's going to pass at some point. Now, yeah. what pieces of it? I don't know. There is one line in there that I have held on to for the last, since I read it. And this line basically states that if you sell a car, you have to keep all the conversation, all of it, across mediums, around the transaction. You have to store it for 24 months. So practical purpose, you're a car dealer. You use a CRM. In the CRM, you send emails out of and text messages, okay? Mm -hmm. So, but the lead started as a chat, some other service. So that, let's say, comes in the CRM. 
maybe, maybe not, but let's say it comes in. So now you have the chat transcript, you have the email, you have the text, but now you use another app like Snapcell or something else that you took video to send to the consumer. Different. Now you use Podium because you want to get a review and you're, you have a conversation with that consumer. Now you have a phone call on your phone system. Now, salesperson is using their personal device to communicate. You see this, we, we live in this multi-channel environment mm -hmm. that is absolutely going to be destructive for the dealer. This was the, one of the driving factors to build core was, I'm going to build this messaging center asynchronous solution where everything can happen inside that. And yeah, we have text and email, but there are wrappers around this comms layer because of this point where lots of conversations are cutting across mediums and everything I've ever seen in auto is all multi-channel. We, we had to build that first true omni-channel that all comms in one spot that I could attach to that customer sales transaction, store it for the dealer for years. And... I think that's going to be a nightmare for the average dealer to figure that piece out uh, without something like we're building, right? Um, I, I see obviously more dealers or, or more states adopting like CCPA, which to me is a watered down version of GDPR. Definitely. The 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 and if more of GDPR starts to enter the U.S. space, it's going to get really hard. Uh, for how we move and store and manage data because the systems, the archaic systems inside auto retail today are not built to manage that. They're not built to like pull someone out of a system and out of multiple systems simultaneously because there is no organized data structure. So that to me is going to be a nightmare regulatory uh, around. And I think as I've watched these states all operate using CCPA as that nucleus, there's all types of nuances and trick bags for dealers. Plus we have TCPA just in general. Texting to me is not only not secure, it is not manageable because most dealers are using six products that all have a text sure. component. So there's no way to normalize the DR tool has a text component. The CRM has a text component. The other tool I use to send videos has a component. My reviews has a component. So how do I opt them out? You can't. And, and again, that's going to break that breaks CCPA because you need to be able to pull them out. So these are those challenges. And I think it's a technology challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but... First, it's understanding the dealer's processes, and the dealer needs to really graphically understand his processes, and then go back and say, okay, what tech do I need to execute my processes? Because right now, they just keep adding stuff, and it creates so much noise, and it's going to be, it's a compliance nightmare. It's, 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 an, it's an unmanageable nightmare currently, and it's only getting worse with more tech. Very true. And, you know, Todd, you've been so gracious with your time. I could talk with you all day. I've, I've learned a lot just doing this podcast, but I wanted to give you kind of the, the last question. And sure. I wanted to get your advice to give to dealers who are just starting to focus on improving identity verification, fraud prevention, and how could they stay ahead of the curve? How could they ensure that they're putting in the right practices as they're just getting started at your dealership? Like, what's your advice to them? Yes. So first thing is they have to look at identity as a process of, of, of the sales process, right? And photocopying a license is not identity. Scanning a license is like baby step of identity. So educating themselves on available applications that are in the market. Um, I mean, beyond core, there's you know, Jumio. There, there's a sea of tools around identity. Now, you do want something easily integrated with the tools you already use, right? I mean, that's kind of why we exist. But I think it's education. Um, there's lots of free eBooks about it. 
uh, out there. I've seen, you know, more than happy to share any resources uh, because I, I feel education and reading about it and understanding that fraud is multidimensional. Uh, it's going to attack you all over the place uh, around identity is one piece, even to the point of spotting liars. So a customer presents like a license to you, right? There's all kinds of crazy things. Like uh, if customers stand up really straight, uh, mm -hmm. I, I will tell you, there is like, so I spent time with FBI guys. So there's these, yeah. there's like probably 10 behavioral things that fraudulent, I'm going to put liars are going to do. Um, I, I, I don't remember them all, but more than happy to again share. Uh, but they were like, they'll point at you. Uh, they'll crank up a little bit. They'll start touching their neck, vulnerable spots on their body. Um, they will do like certain actions. It's crazy that huh. all these things happen of subliminally. So training your salespeople to start to spot weird behavior, having the spidey sense that we naturally have is important. And we know when something's off with someone, they either talk in circles um, they'll, they'll just try to repeat themselves. This is like a glitch in the matrix that it liars got up. Uh, no, 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 no. This is right. No, this is correct. No, this is my real stuff. These are tall tale signs. Something is amiss in the process. So mm -hmm. I, I believe we're a great lie detectors. If you have just basic understanding of it as a first line of defense, then I think your process dictates the technology. And look, dealers have to decide how much risk is acceptable. And, you know, is it worth three, four bucks a customer to not have risk? Or you say, no, it's, I only want to spend a dollar. You're going to take on more risk, right? Like, I think dealers have to balance that in their business. And I, I think smart dealers will always look to de-risk their business, especially around something so critical and affects so much. Like if you're a used car operator, mm -hmm. your relationship with your lenders is absolutely critical to the survival of your business. Definitely. If you send them one or two bad transactions, you're blackballed, man. And you're, you're gonna get dried up and good luck finding a new resource because they all talk. It, it's not like, oh, I, I sent a bad one to Allied, so I'm just going to move to BOA, uh, Fifth Third. They all, they all are like, there's a little list, man. It's like a Santa bad list. They won't talk <laughs> about it, but it exists because, look, they're protecting themselves. And for the, the lender, the lender has to trust the dealership completely, that the dealer is going to protect them. And it starts with identity. It starts with verifying information. It starts with gathering steps that are valid, right? It starts with these things. And I think smart dealers realize that if they do a good job there, they, they it gives them great trust on the other side. It gives them a lender that buys deeper. It gives them a lender that streamlines transactions, minimizes steps because, you know, there's a trust that's built between the dealer and the lender. But if you want to erode the trust, Send them one bad deal. Send them two. Huh. So I, I think dealers should begin to really start to pay more attention to this. It hasn't probably been as top of mind, right? Um, because when things are good, everyone's happy. Uh, but as dealers start scraping, looking for more deals, I mean, listen, fraudsters are going to come out. And they're already out. I mean, I, I, I'm watching them all over. I, I see deals every day fraudulent people fraudulent person comes in it's like i'm not i'm not i'm not I'm, you can't verify my phone what, what are you talking about i'm not coming here i'm leaving and a sales guy's <laughs> like no don't leave and i'm like let him leave that's on purpose <laughs> yeah the, one of the biggest things we see is it's not just stopping the fraud it's deterring the fraud from ever starting so when a fraudster runs into a system there's other dealers that don't have a system they'll just go down the road and you want that to happen. You do, you just don't want to be the guy holding the bag when the lender comes back and says you owe me forty seven grand. Hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I feel dealers look. It's education and it's looking at your business from a lens of de risking it and thinking about it that you know find a trusted partner who wants to help you sell more cars 
but is there to protect you even when you don't want to protect yourself. <laughs> kind of like how I look at it. Like, you know, you got to have like the dad saying, listen, you can jump off this cliff, but it's going to hurt at 60 feet down, right? Like <laughs> I'd wear your shoes if you're going to pop in there. Like you, you, he's still going to let you do your stuff, but he's going to caution you on, on your journey. So Very well put. I can only Tom. say this, Zach, because I have a 14 year old who's crazy. Like I've always been. So I'm like, Oh my God, what's this kid is going to be the death of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, something, uh, I guess for me to look forward to, but I'll tell you this, Todd, it's been an awesome episode. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. It's been awesome. Uh, it's great to reconnect and I, I've had nothing but a blast today. Thank you so much. <laughs>